winning 90% of your new business because you have some sort of incredible value. I'm going to take a bit of a different angle. You know, I've got a budget this big. I'm going to give it to you because you have a, a really killer plan. You give a Red Bull to a turtle, what do you expect? <laughs> I think that's a dead turtle. <laughs> so let's move on to... Uh, Be Cheers. 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 Does your current premium finance company lock you into long-term agreements? That's because they don't want you talking to us. At IFS, we win your business the good old fashioned way, with customer service. I know you don't always have to use a premium finance company, but when you do, you should use IFS. Cheers. Hi there, welcome to the Digital Insurance Pint Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Rees, president of GRTR Consulting. And as always, I'm joined by my colleagues, Steve Earle, president of Cheap Insurance, Adam Mitchell, president of Mitchell & Whale, and Jeff Roy, president of Excalibur Insurance. Gentlemen, we are going to talk about mergers and acquisitions today. So let's uh, get on our gossip uh, hats, our anecdotal uh, viewpoints and dive right into it here. Did you say mur did you say murders and acquisition or mergers? That's what I heard, I heard murders. <laughs> is this like mur is this like murder she wrote? Murder Hornets. We got a little TV show, Murder She Wrote. And the episode goes in the tank. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> with other people's money, so I have a little bit of fun with it, right? Let me, let me go back in time here a little bit. 20 years ago, um, I was working at the company that was then called ING, and ING had just started to get into the uh, financing game. And I can distinctly recall back in those days that uh, there was a lot of you know smaller brokers buying smaller brokers. There was a few uh, burgeoning mega brokers, but the price tag for brokers back in those days was one times commission to maybe 1.5 times commission. And today, I don't know about you guys, but I'm hearing anywhere from three and a half upwards to four and a half. I've heard higher. You've heard higher than that. Why do we think that is? Why is the multiple doubled, tripled almost, uh, maybe the quadrupled in some cases from 20 years ago? Maybe a little supply and demand. I think there's a the little bit of the not quite free money, but there's a ton of money around. You almost have these mega buyers that are buying up a ton of things and they're probably getting better and better at the full integration suite of bringing them on. So it's back in the late 90s, early 2000s ish. I don't remember that far back, to be honest, but there was really four big mega buyers. Uh, what was then Canada BrokerLink, obviously now BrokerLink owned by uh, Intact Financial Corp was one of them. Uh, West, you know, Then Western Financial Group, now just called Western, was another one. Uh, Vector, which doesn't really exist anymore, and Equisure, which I guess sort of exists in the uh, intact uh, financial sphere these days. Uh, they, they, they were the big, they were they were the bigger of the buyers out there. But now there's a number of other buyers out there, and who are the new the new er players? To kind of back to your thing, like you know, Adam mentions money's free, a lot a lot cheaper. You know, back you try buying a brokerage back in the 80s when interest rates were 20 percent, uh, pretty difficult task, right? Also automation and, and EBITDA is, I'd like to look back to see what an EBITDA was for a brokerage back in the 80s and early 90s compared to now, but the venture capital money, which we'll talk about in a bit of new entrants, you know, if you can get a 30 or 35% EBITDA, what other industries can you get that in uh, consistently year over year with a reoccurring revenue? I think that's what's attracted some of the VC money because, again, unless you're in the software business or some real startup businesses where you can, uh, you know, create a unicorn that goes off the chart and goes to billion dollar status and you make a valuation, there's very few industries that do that year over year with clockwork, right? Do you think there's any froth compared to the uh, stock market. So the stock market's on like a, a rip roaring piece and you can say inflation, you can, you can go at a number of different angles, but is there overlap there? Like certainly the private equity funded angles would say there is. There are, um, you know, a few companies that are out there that are either directly financing acquisitions or supporting financing acquisitions. Um, and in the case of at least one, maybe a few of those uh, insurance companies, they benefit not only from the EBITDA that Jeff brought up, but also from the underwriting volume and underwriting profit 
that is generated when businesses move from you know to to the acquiring uh, acquiring entity obviously a company buys a company it's a dollar for a dollar right so you buy a company it's 500 million dollars let's say gore demutualizes and they're at 500 million dollars they would probably get 500 million dollars you know but if if a, bro, a company you know buys brokerages and they pay four times commission and the average commission is 15 percent it's less than a dollar right so that's where some of them have said hey i can get i can grow volume and control volume a lot faster doing it that way you know hence the true canadian broker link has done very well like not only that they bought rsa which owns johnson's so it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out too right did you guys see i don't know if i shared that mcgill paper that came out about um sort of the competition bureau and controlled distribution. And so right now, most of the focus is around what's the total makeup of premium under your sort of underwriting guys. But um, this McGill paper that came out said, you know, you kind of got to consider the controlled broker. So in the CBL language, if you control two, three billion of broker distribution, although it could be a couple of markets, you're controlling that volume as well. Does that mean that Intax market share will be dictated by what they the, what they have with CBL and all the other markets as well? Well, I've I've been told that Intax is a runway for 32 to 35% of the market. At one point it was 30, but that number keeps growing. Now, whether that includes their brokers, because not only do they have CBL brokerages, but they also have a bunch of equity in brokers. So there's there's the brokerage MGA, uh, M&A, and there's the brokerage M&A by carriers, and then there's the carrier by carrier M&A, right? We just had Intact conclude the RSA deal. Something's likely to happen with with economical. They're about to demutualize. They have some protection over the next little bit. The secret regional players that are funded, actually funded by insurance companies. So you have um, in our neck of the woods, we had uh, Archway who was doing tons and tons of acquisitions, and they recently uh, went CBL. Everybody everybody talks about the buyers all the time, and you know you tend to categorize those into private equity like NFP or um, ins- insurer dominated ones like BrokerLink or, you know, big brokers like Hub or whatever. Who's, tell me about the sellers, right? Tell me like what, what kind of, what are the common denominators amongst the sellers or what prompts a broker who's been running his business successfully for 20 years to sell? Recently, I'd say it's, I'm done with this bullshit. I'm thrown in the towel. There's far too much friction. Um, all these suppliers are giving me nothing but grief, like way, way, like multitudes of what it was before. And, um, if they're not, if they don't have their shit together in their back shop, it could be crushing. Multiples are really high. So, uh, I thought about it maybe five, six, eight years from now. I don't know. That's, it's looking awfully good right now. And maybe multiples will go down. So, yeah, the, it, it's not worth the bullshit anymore. I'm gone. Thank you. Where's the check? Hey, you know, it's COVID's been horrible. You know, it, it's been bleak. I don't. I, another day, if you call the right person on a Friday, they're going to give you the keys to the office and walk away. There's some people probably in that headspace. There's other people that, you know, they've reached the end of the runway and they're like, you know, I got to get out of here. The multiples are great. You know, is the government going to take away the capital gains tax? You know, what's Trudeau going to do to start clawing stuff back? You know, what time is a good time to exit? And I thought maybe I could do four or five more years. But if, uh, you know, our great uh, leader continues to do what he's doing and blow all this money we don't have, he's going to have to get it somewhere. Where is it going to come from? Gee, it's going to come from capital gains being knocked off. And, you know, there is the law that was passed that allows you to pass a brokerage through to the next generation, which is great. IBAC worked really hard at that and they got that could pass, but a lot of next generations don't want to take over the brokerage. You know, these people don't have a succession plan. They don't have the employees with enough cash to buy it and there's no employee ownership. So they're left to try and get the highest price and exit. And uh, so there's a bunch of people in that category. 
There's some other people going, gee, can I survive? You know, it used to be, you had to be three or four or five million in a small area, then 10, then 20. You know, Intact said it had to be 100 a couple of years ago. How much is enough? You know, what's the size where you can make a good living and, you know, you don't lose a few people and the sky's not falling? What's that magic number? Because as you get bigger as a broker, you have different challenges. So what, you know, there's a bunch of people that don't think they're big enough. They're not getting the same deals that big guys are getting on commission. They're not getting the same overrides or CPCs. You know, whether those CPCs will continue on with all the FISRA work and all the shakedown going on the broker bridges, that's a different question altogether. But there could be some changes also in the compensation with the FISRA work that could reduce revenue. So so some people are being pushed out by fear. Yeah, other people said, hey, we got the biggest runway in history. You know, we're coming back from COVID. We got two or three great years of growth. So hold on and, and ride it out, right? So it depends what day of the week you ask people, what perception you look at, but there's a lot of different people fighting through these things. The trends are all kind of going one way. And I used to say, hey, you kind of have two strategies. You got to pick one. It's scale or niche. I'm now starting to get convinced it's just scale because I'm a pretty firm believer that the scale people are going to buy the niche people. So even if you have like a really good, helicopter program or equestrian or you know a chemical manufacturer or something that you're just the best how long before one of these big acquiring shops throws a private equity level check down with an extra zero than you've imagined they integrate that knowledge they start to expand it and like it it all seems to end in scale we've seen some franchise plays we've seen some franchise independent producer angles i don't know that we've seen some banding together of uh, groups to actually operate and exchange ownership and become succession plan. So I'm wondering if there's room for a more rampant franchise like expansion of that. I would say, you know what, the CBN Canadian broker network model is somewhat that, you know, sharing best practices. There's some stuff where people are doing that. So it is, it is one of the first forays into it where they're trying to maintain the independence of brokerages in the Canadian channel, right? Not external money, not selling out to companies. Somebody's got to have a stab at taking it one step further. Uh, so instead of just a collective best practice and some angles of like, if Tom bought 50% of each of us and then we operated truly as one united force, you could get some scales and efficiency. Here's the problem with that, Adam. Right now, like, you you can't get the three of us to agree on shit. How are you going to get, like, a whole bunch of brokers to agree on a business model, a business plan, the framework of the, 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 the share arrangement, uh, the in, the out? Uh, like, you, like, that's one thing that frustrates the frig out of, uh, and I use frig, not fuck. <laughs> if somebody can overcome this problem and navigate those pieces and, and, and put down a, hey, here's a playbook. So should you reach wit's end of whatnot, here's an alternative to completely exiting and like throwing your hands in the air. You have the private equities fighting. You have the insurance company funded ones fighting. You have the, the high growth franchise sign up here as an independent producer Thing going a couple of things quickly steve like a, i would say 75 percent of the time we probably do agree on this on this show uh you know it might be a little different semantics but there's a lot of stuff that we do agree fundamentally on the basics that's not going to change right the problem with the setting up a cluster or a group is again you have our biggest strength is our independence it's our greatest weakness what made our superpower that made you good may not play well with others but once you realign the rules and figure out where you're at then there's something good you can get at it, right? That's why, like you mentioned, CBN. Well, you got Jan from uh, Cinex. That's he. If you look at the news press releases, he's personally bought it. He's starting to control quite a bit of volume there. So he's basically getting involved in that and you know taking it to the next level, contrary to what somebody had mentioned earlier, right? So you're seeing that happen. You know, what's the right way? There is no right way, right? There's different ways of doing it. It's only time will tell which one wins out. The differentiation on what we're doing, like are you know it, it, if i was supplied with one way of doing things under a banner that i just had to put things in once and i got price and somebody took the mess away i would probably be more profitable than i am now even giving up something to a bigger banner i i don't know 
What do you think, Adam? If you're um, s small and not growing by leaps and bounds, like pick your poison, right? And I, and I think kind of make the deal early as like, I'm not sure what holdouts are going to get. Because right now there's a lot of competition and there's some options and some things. And like, I think you got to start thinking about this because I think the trend line of what size matters is going to keep getting bigger. I think the trend line of uh, compensation via CPCs, bonus, override, opportunities, that trend line is going to keep going to the bigger and bigger entities. Maybe rightfully so, given, you know, the efficiencies found at the markets. Like, I don't think it's a coincidence all the insurance companies are going this way, viewing it this way. Life insurance companies went this way. Now there's, what, four or five big MGAs? and every other independent agent sort of filters up through them. This is the piece that pisses me off when I hear about uh, a local broker is sold and I hear from company people, oh, they sold or, you know, because it went, it went to a CBL or it went here or went there. The thing is, those insurance companies are the ones that did that. Like, you were so inefficient to deal with, you caused this and you don't even realize it. You know, you're doing things to these independent brokers and making their lives so miserable that they have no choice. And then you're the ones who are bitching about it. It's survival of the fittest right now. You have to adapt. You have to change. You know, as masters of scale, you got fires burning when you go home, right? But part of the problem is some aren't trying to deal with change and some just aren't dealing with it at all. Right. Like there is a bunch that are, you know, trying to call Steve out a bit of like that example he gave is a bit of like asking for yesteryear. It's asking for mail to come back, asking for taxis to come back. And it's like all the data points are pointing one direction. So let's let's pour a beer out and like have a good cry. But then we better get busy adapting, evolving, like figuring it out. And here's another provocative angle. I hope it doesn't get easier. Right. Like I, 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 I begrudge it for that 10 minutes, you know, what piece. And then it's like, all right, sleeves are rolling up and I'm going to figure this out. Right. And like every time there is complexity and margin and peace in there, that's, that's opportunity. That's, that's an opportunity to come in and differentiate, survive a little longer, evolve a little faster. Reality is that everything changes from time to time. Right. So if, if things get easier then something else, will come along, which could be lower commissions, right? Which could be, could put some other, could pressure on you. You're always gonna have pressure. If, if, if something becomes status quo, then that pressure is gonna be felt somewhere else. That's, that's the law of capitalism. Well, okay, so here, here, Tom, if you're the insurance company, right? And we are your portfolio in one sense, uh, because this represents distribution. And Jeff's growing at uh, 1%, Steve's growing at, 28% and Adam shrinking by 5%. If this is your portfolio allocation, like where would you leave the most amount of commission and which stack would you take some chips from to go the other way? Obviously loss ratio is typically the leading uh, influencer of those things. Uh, Cause ironically as an insurance company, you make more money as you shrink. Sure, but but if you take any longer term approach, like you yeah. you gotta have the balance. Like, and we do it in our team. Like, we do it and say, hey, who is the most valuable, most effective? Like, how can I over resource that? How can I line that up? Absolutely, and I can tell you, having done it personally at you know a couple of different companies, and and I know others doing it as well. Every carrier is looking at all their brokers, looking at who is in the top tier, who's in the bottom tier, and the top tier guys get the time and attention and investment, whether that's money or or access to new stuff or access to senior people or whatever it is that top tiers get and the benefit of it. So if you're in that bottom tier, that's a problem for you with that carrier. If, now, if, you, if you're in that situation with all carriers, you got a serious problem. Here's, here's the algebra of selling, if, if you will, for me, Elaine, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that we receive all the same phone calls from all the same acquiring companies that make the rounds and try and buy things. And, and my answer to them usually is like, well, here's some of the equation. Uh, I make X. Uh, here's my quality of life as in here's how many golf rounds I get to play and the general office balance I have and what I get to tinker with. Um, and here's my growth on trajectory. So if you are going to buy us or we're going to entertain any part of this, the algebra is one of these needs to over index by a bunch, right? Like, do I get a raise? Do I get to do more fun stuff? Um, 
or is the equity going to grow faster? And I think it's kind of almost universal of anybody considering selling, whether it's Steve or big broker, small broker, depending maybe on your age, your abilities, your market supply, you say, hey, if I sell part or everything to somebody, do one of these three things go up? Right. And as you say, the insurance companies are evaluating these things of like, if your revenue is going to start going down because you can read the trend line, or if your book is already shrinking because you lost a market and your three markets you have are now out of market competitive cycle, you could legitimately join into something else that is going to see your life get a little bit better, your, you know, stability or equity return um, shore up. Let me let me challenge that. You, you guys are all independent business owners with the vast majority of your personal uh, wealth tied up in your businesses. Isn't selling the end game? We're currently on a very aggressive track to try and jump the gap. And we say, okay, we want to separate the, from the Peloton, separate from the herd to try and join that group. And I, as the business owner or majority of them trying to say, can this turn into a generational company? Now there's gonna be all kinds of turmoil amongst self-driving cars, downward pressure on, on rate, premium, technology, whatever. But can we outpace the pack at such a pace that you can get some relevance to go on? Yeah, it, dep it depends what you mean by, by victory and defeat. I guess I was, I, was, I was picking up on your sort of implicit bias that selling sounded like defeat. I said that, Tom. And it wasn't it wasn't me saying it. It was it was I was tired of he hearing insurance companies saying, oh, that guy's a sellout because it was an insurance company comment about losing a book. Right. Really. And and and, and my point was to contradict what Adam said was, well, you know, you, you're you're part of the problem that orchestrated what you thought was probably an early exit because Collectively, our suppliers have thrown enough bullshit at people on the verge that they just said, fuck it, I'm done. This is bullshit. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of that seller, right? Jeff, you're 50 or so, Adam, 40-ish, Steve, 40-ish, yeah? I'll be 50 in April. There's a lot of factors that go into maximizing the value of your business when it comes to the sale. Why don't we, let's, let's talk a bit about what what should if you're if you're one of those ones who's heading towards that victory lap where you sell your your business off to someone else whether it's next generation or some third party what what do you think you need to do to maximize the value of that business i th i think it's cash flow i think the the highest number being paid for is cash flow and whether that's normalized uh ebitda or true ebitda or or pure bottom line cash flow but the biggest numbers i hear are from the highest stated EBITDA. And I, I guess in turn, like to unpack, how do you get there? It's, it's via efficiency and stability. And, you know, if you can layer on top of that, some growth, maybe a program or a competitive angle or a moat or something like those help, but everything seems to boil down to free cash flow. You know, I've had some friends sell their business. I've watched how they went through it. You know, there's different, there's a couple of books, you, you know, there's a couple, uh, consultants that can run you through and and Tom you can probably I'd like to hear your points here how to get your brokerage sales ready and what documents you need like most people will you know whether you do it yourself or whether you hire a third party to put it out and do private bidding there's different ways to go at it you know whether you engage one person engage multiple people everybody's got a different strategy a, bro a broker that is sale ready is one that's done the work over the last three five ten twenty years to make their shop efficient uh, it's you know a real good sales organization that's got a good customer experience and so on. That's that's what's going to sell the most. Like Adam made the point that a lot of these deals are done on on EBITDA because at the end of the day it is an investment. You are buying, you're spending a capital amount of money, and you're expecting essentially X amount of return on it. Whether it's whether you're buying a GIC or a dividend fund or a brokerage, at the end of the day it's the same thing, right? It's about the return, and so that that you, you need to look at that return and say. Oh, okay. So Buddy's running a 30, 35% EBITDA. What's going into that? Is his, does he have good retention? Does he have good new business? Has he got an efficient back shop? Has he got, you know, good loss ratio? So he's actually generating a bunch of EBITDA. How sustainable is all that stuff? If the last two years, he just got lucky and had a stellar loss ratio and half his EBITDA has come from his CPC, it tells you something. 
if Buddy hasn't had a CPC in 10 years, that tells you something else, right? So you know, all of these factors that go into it, like I, I look at it and say, you get your top line piece, you got your expense piece, and you got your bottom line piece. What, what are the factors that go into that? How sustainable are they? How have they fluctuated over time? And all, all that intelligence goes into the data room as well as first personnel contracts, uh, lease contracts, and anything that pertains to your business. But but that's that's the story you're telling is my top line is growing at X and it's sustainable because Y. My bottom line is a strong EBITDA and it's sustainable because whatever. That's the story you're trying to tell. You want you want a bit of a bidding war too. Like one of the wise guys in the business said, you know, in the end of the day, as long as you have two people fighting over your business, you're in good shape. There's there's some deals that are done on a handshake. You know, I think that's that's almost a thing of the past. Um, these days, there's a lot of businesses out there who have professional M and A guys who've been doing this for 20 years, who know all the ins and outs. You know, who come to you with all the documents, you know, signed, sealed, and delivered, and make it easy for you, right? But is that in your best interest or their best interest? So there's, you know, having, having, uh, Adam, you hit the nail right in the head there, having multiple parties talk to you. Cause it's not just, it's not always about the dollar. And Jeff talked about this as well. You might take less money because your staff will be looked after. You might take less money because your name will stay on the building or whatever. I'll preface this with, I'm not the brightest guy. So I seem to understand the world in parables and these little catch sayings. And like one of the other ones that burned in my brain is somebody saying it's always cheaper pay the lawyer to write the contract. So if somebody gives you a 70 page purchase agreement, do you think you can really understand that? The uh, Cooks and Walker, I'm not sure if they're Baker Tilly now, but Cooks and Walker guys, they did a really good job. And I know Pilot back in the day and then Aviva brought them out to speak to brokers and some different broker groups have used them quite a bit. They had a really good spreadsheet that talked about what you need to look at to get your brokerage in good position, you know, in terms of operating expenses, you know, budgeting, you know, basically employee contracts, all that stuff. They work you all the way through it, you know, even do a retirement plan to walk through what you need for retirement. It. They had a really good spreadsheet, and I, I got a copy of it from 15 years ago. It hasn't really changed that much, but you want to make sure you get some advice before you do it. You know, never do it on a whim. If you're having a bad Friday, do it. You know, never let emotions do it. If I gave you unlimited money, right, and said, go out, tackle all these things, merge them all together, and you take all these little shops and pieces, squish it together, and you get a real meaningful, I don't say you get a billion, right? And from that point that you got that, how close do you think you are to being ready for a public sniff test of going to a public market? I'm like, that's just going to be a collection of, you know, type A assholes and businesses and, you know, weird practices, weird systems, like where Steve said, we don't agree on anything. Like nothing there is built for efficiency and awesomeness and like is going to live up to the the bay street wall street sniff test well they're still continue to do it and it's it, i don't see it stopping anytime soon there's going to be some disruption in our industry over the next 10 years obviously you know uh embedded insurance where basically stuff's gonna be built right in we'll take a dent out of the market uh you know the self-driving cars and the electronic cars and everything where it's built right in that's going to be interesting so we're going to see a shift now it's going not, not going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next year but it's going to be interesting to shift and you're going to have to have scale and size to be able to do it in a value proposition not everybody can build their own api and embed themselves in there you see how small people can do it but having all that back shop back office can cr control all that stuff. It's going to be interesting. It'd be interesting to see if one of these big conglomerates that has a billion dollars in revenue, do they finally say, you know what, I'm tired of this insurance company. I'm going to set up my own insurance company and write 200, take $200 million and push it over there and set up my own company to compete, right? Like I think you may see, like you, you have companies where you cut out the middle and you basically kind of connect right into a reinsurer you might see some of them do that with, they don't, they're not top heavy and yet their brokerage can provide the claims and everything right into it. Here's the other one. And, and I don't know at that time of filming, it's not public knowledge. Um, but I think most of us know about it, that uh, there's been a, a really big outside competitor coming new to our space. So quest trade has bought an $80 million brokerage in our space and quest trade as a company, has, I don't know, somewhere around a million customers and in our perspective, relative unlimited money. I'd call that pretty 
friggin' disruptive or it certainly has the potential to be really friggin' disruptive. Let's say you're a really diligent operator and you got your finger right on the pulse of the marketplace and you do monthly SWOT analysis to be looking internally and externally. How does how does that thing happening not like hit it and be like, oh fuck, new landscape, new analysis. I, I now need to register and like run a little game theory on what's happening. Where are they going? What are they doing? Am I prepared for it? Can I respond? So you're suggesting that all these small town brokers need to call me and help them polish up their financials for sale? You, you can go that way. Like I, I don't know the answer. I, I'm a small town. I'm a small town broker. So is Lance. I think we'll be okay for a couple of days, but there's going to be lots of threats, right? Like there's going to be a lot of stuff changing. And again, the problem is like getting on the first page of Google right now, it's going to be increasingly hard every year when you get these big Uber brokers that have 35 billion locations across Canada and they've got SEO coming out the yin yang and they've linked all their pages together. They're going to start dominating the first page and it's going to be harder for certain people to dominate or get to show up in the world. Let's talk about brokers who want to uh, expand, and you know whether that's organically or through acquisition or whatever. There, uh, there's a few places that you can get money from. You, in theory, can get money from the bank. You can definitely get money from carriers. You can probably get money from the PE VC space, and you can likely partner with another broker. And so let me put those four choices up there in front of you guys and. I'll, I'll ask each one of you, uh, and we'll go Steve, Adam, Jeff, because that's the order of you guys on my screen here. If you could, if you, if you only had one, one of the four choices to make, so you're going to expand, you're going to invest in your business, whether that's acquisition, organic, whatever, but you need money to do that. Are you going to go to the bank? Are you going to go to a carrier? Are you going to go to the VC world? Or are you going to partner up with another broker? I'll I'll speak to ours, right? And I'll be pretty transparent. Like we have used insurance company money. Um, for the betterment of both sides. And so we had loans with carriers and we still have loans with carriers um, that helped us advance and grow that book and business in peace. We've also had loans with banks um, and they've both been highly functional. Um, and I guess, frankly, we also have sort of an equity relationship with another broker. So I might be living in all of the categories it's other than the BC, <laughs> right? Um, and I, I don't actually hate that strategy even in hindsight because I do like having multiples um, that keep each other honest and you don't get pinned against the wall, which is a singular option. Um, the insurance company certainly can take more creative long-term financial understandings of it. Banks are banks are banks are banks. It's you are in the box and if you dare go outside the box, you can have a big problem. So if you're in any point of burning cash, they're, they're a cash flow lender. You need to and they'll, they'll advance you some money if you can service the debt very safely with a big margin. VC, I would, I would be the slowest with, because I, I think they are, for, for all due respect, if I need to say that, cold-blooded killers. Well, I mean, and you did point out that there's there's cons to the bank and the carrier side. The bank side is, you know, it's got to be very stable and you can't take any big risks, And essentially. But if you're in the box, it's very free, easy money, low not free, but low cost relative to everything else. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a spectrum in a sense where the banks are sort of the least touch, but probably the least, least amount of rocket fuel. Then the carriers are in the middle and then the VCs are at the far end where it's, let's go to the moon or we're going to explode halfway there. The bottom line is you have to look at if the the project is say you're 20 million you want to get to 100 million what kind of velocity do you want to get do you want to get there in two years three years do you want hockey stick growth you know masters of scale seven x type stuff or you want to do 15 points and get there six seven years later or do you want to get there in two or three years right that depends who you're going to call now that said if you do that you're going to need a lot more money quick and you can burn through it and you can f it up pretty quick and blow the whole thing up like the ship may not get out of uh, spacex orbit and blow up and you're not going to land it back down so there's some risk there but it depends how much risk you want to take what you know as i tell adam what does winning look like for you because you have all the pros and cons of each of those options you know i haven't used venture capital i know friends that have for insure tech startups and you know what they're taking a big chunk and you know a lot of people are giving up control or ownership or a lot of control on that so they want to take that baby to you know unicorn status and then sell it or and get money out of it and then you're gone so you've lost control of your baby so venture capital gets you there maybe make you a lot of money but could make you very sad if you're attached to your baby your business right so you know that's that's a, a side effect right there company money's great but it could run out companies could shift plans right you know the one thing i'll point out is growth is expensive 
you know, acquiring a client is going to do nothing but continue to increase and get more and more difficult every day, every week, every month. If you look in the digital world right now, costs are going up. More people are playing in digital, buying, you know, pay-per-click. They're buying AdWords. Those costs have gone up. You know, it's getting harder to rank and show up in the first page of Google because the big boys are really dominating it, whether they're using ethical or not, but they've got a lot of good links to get their page rank up there. So, again, it's going to get tougher and tougher to grow and hit that jump factor unless you come up with a new play you look at things differently but here's the thing that could seed your thought on whether to sell or stay or go uh, I, I'll leave the company at it for the moment I had a, a second out of command at a large insurance company say very straight face don't quote to me isn't isn't the future of all this aggregators seeding direct writers because we were going through hey there's choice and whatnot and he said like well doesn't an aggregator solve the choice side, and then they go right to the direct writer, get served for a while until the person wants to go back to market. And I think you got to take that statement incredibly seriously. For one, it, it could be a very true threat. And two, this is the highest level of legitimate insurance companies talking and thinking about this and this seed strategy. We've got the best value proposition because we, we're like the, the Costco is. We've got a ton of things in our shelves. We're not like a one aisle wonder like some of these people. Now, if these people with the one aisle can drive their costs down like Geico and do things at a scale like the U.S., that's a different conversation. But so far, luckily, none of them have done that to any significant level, you know, to my knowledge. But if that's where it's going, Adam, where, hey, these aggregators get all the traffic and dominate, which, you know, we saw some aggregators get bought because other aggregators were struggling, right? And they needed to deduce from the person that was doing better, and they threw the money at it, right? So, you know, there's also a comp competition between the aggregators. What Jeff says is true. We, we, we still have the best value proposition despite our suppliers f fucking us at every angle and 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 not enabling us to retake market share and give a give a better even better value proposition i'm i'm long in that position but i want to i want to take a provocative angle to debate against it for a second to play devil's advocate and say no every aggregator that's out there I'll be one person owns three of the big ones and there's a couple other small ones. They all have more market choice than any of us. They all are open 24 seven to provide a solution faster than us. And the only thing that we weigh in to do better is on two occasions, both surrounding advice of like, hey, how do I interpret this data point? Why is that? Why is it that we're- Which we, part of it? Which part of it? Do that? Answer fucking questions. To begin with they're not beating us at any part of the tech they're just entering a different part of the value problem they've got teams of they've got teams of people that can that outbid you and kick your ass on adwords and they're killing you on the organic and if you look at all their links that's where they're killing us i think that w w when we go back to measuring vc or insurance company or you want to grow and all that kind of stuff it, it, it it's going to be different for everybody because if you want hyper, hyper growth and you want to go like rocket fuel VC, that's a different proposition to you as a human being and the broker you want to become and what that's going to do to your life versus, oh, I'm going to make a couple of acquisitions locally in my trading area and I'm going to partner with a broker or whatever. Like, what is that going to do to your life? Where are you in your life and where do you want to go? So those are measurements as well. As, as a 49 year old guy, would I go VC because I've got like 20 years left in my tank and I want to, you know, I'm a, I'm a young buck like Adam and I want to be a billion dollar broker in three months. You got to live life in your own terms, right? The good thing about this, we're one of the best business in the world where you can somewhat live your life in your own terms. Now that's debatable with a bunch of stuff thrown at us during COVID and, you know, basically scrambling around for talent. So I, I don't know, I, I'm not living it on the exact terms I'd love to, but you got to do what you got to do during times, right? You got to adapt, you got to shift and that's the way it is. Is retention important to your brokerage? Of course it is. That's why at IFS, we have a cancellation prevention process. Want more details? Give us a call. I know you don't always use a premium finance company, but when you do, you should use IFS. Cheers.